Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. This paper is uh, really very nice and also very challenging, written by five uh, very skillful uh, authors. I'm the poor discussant that has to fight uh, to get his presence felt. Uh, and that's difficult. Uh, so, and I don't have a lot of time, I guess 10 minutes, right? Okay, so uh, I have to be uh, very efficient. Um, so I like the paper, there are lots of uh, results. Uh, you've heard most of them uh, in the presentation. And, um, uh, and there is a, in a certain sense, it's kind of a biased uh, paper, don't blame them, uh, in favor of fruit exchange rates. But uh, one can tell stories where everything is consistent with flow tension rate, but the issue of causality is still there, right? If you believe strongly on that, then you'll be reassured that uh, here everything seems to work out the way you expect it, okay? Uh, now, to make this more uh, fun, uh, I, I would like to take a, a different view, so I would cast a little bit of doubt on, on the effectiveness of uh, floating exchange rates by itself, if not accompanied by other policies. Now that point is made in the paper. Uh, obviously institutions seem to have played a very important role in the creation of a deep uh, capital market uh, and so on. I mean, one can develop theories which are perfectly consistent with that. So I have no objection to, to monetary policy as such. I'm just wondering uh, to what extent, um, or we should be wondering about to what extent uh, floating exchange rates uh, perhaps look very good when you look at uh, uh, Chile because conditions were somewhat favorable. So let me, let me just go through this. I don't have time to develop any uh, point in uh, great detail. Uh, this is gonna be the roadmap. So let me say a little bit about financial conditions because you heard that in the presentation uh, that um, they compare, for example, 19, the Asian slash uh, Russian crisis with, um, with the Lehman crisis, say, of 2008. And, uh, there are, and, and, and if you just go through that, uh, it get the impression that uh, uh, 2008 was much uh, more uh, uh, efficient, if you wish, uh, less waste, waste of resources, and partly maybe the exchange rate did, uh, did, uh, did the work. But uh, the financial conditions were very different, actually. Uh, I don't want to go to the details of this, but this is uh, uh, just uh, uh, fix your attention on, on the Russian crisis, which is the, the last one. Uh, and the red line, the red line is, uh, the MB, the measure market by bond index. <coughs> and you see that when the Russian started, the crisis started in, uh, in 1998, uh, there was a sharp increase in the MB from uh, 500 basis points to more than uh, 1,500 basis points. And uh, what's interesting about this, and that's the thing I want to focus on, is that uh, notice that it takes a long time for the MB to go back to the, where it was before the crisis. It <laughs> takes about four years. <coughs> and uh, when you look at the LAC7, which is the seven largest countries in the Latin American uh, region, you see that uh, there's a very big impact of that on the region, not just an in individual. <coughs> not just an individual uh, country, may I have? It's a very sharp decline in the, uh, in, uh, the growth of investment. <coughs> if you look at growth, all of a sudden, as if uh, somebody waved the magic wand, uh, all of a sudden the, the region goes flat And once again, this is not an individual uh, country. And when you compare the situation with uh, what happened in, this is the MB now, uh, and the period, I hope you, you can read it, uh, begins in 1999, 
Uh, and uh, so the shaded, what we do here is to define, uh, I define systemic sudden stop as a situation where the MB, uh, where the MB <coughs> increases more than two standard deviations compared to the MBC story, right? So, and I, I mark that by, by sh shade. So the shaded areas are systemic at the stop. The idea is this is so stop doesn't have an individual country, but have the two, uh, the, to the MB for all emerging markets. So it's a weight, uh, it's, it's a, 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 some average of, of that. So you see that around the uh, first crisis, which is discussed in the paper, it's, it's a period where you have systemic sudden stop all over. So, this, but uh, when you go further and you hit the uh, second <coughs> big jump there, uh, which is associated with the Lima crisis, certainly that goes over to, to standard deviations and it becomes a, a systemic sudden stop but it very quickly goes down. That's what's interesting about this. The, the, the previous one was long lasting, much longer lasting than the, than the second one. So yes, it was a serious, a severe uh, a crisis, uh, but it lasted, it didn't last much, and you can, uh, I mean, I guess the conventional wisdom is that uh, the explanation for this is the uh, hyperactivity of global central banks that immediately come forward and, and provided uh, international liquidity uh, to the system. So it's very difficult to put Chile into this, but uh, all I want to, to, to uh, in my view, uh, this is something that one uh, would like to adjust for because uh, certainly the conditions, uh, you, uh, you wouldn't be surprised that uh, the recovery, for example, was faster, which is one of the results in the paper. <coughs> and, uh, and since then, except for a slight, uh, almost it touches the set, two standard deviations that's in 2013, March 2013, uh, 2016, uh, so it touches the two standard deviation very quickly goes down. So we can say that we have lived the period from this perspective of relative peace. And uh, <laughs> actually I would, uh, if I didn't have to uh, cover more uh, bases here, I would uh, continue discussing this one because I'm very concerned that policymakers, uh, no, not in Chile, I mean everywhere in the major market, may uh, become too complacent given the good conditions that we have lived through. Uh, this period, right? So it's something that I want to put a, a red light or at least a, uh, a yellow light uh, for, for us to keep in mind. Uh, so, uh, but I, let me let me show you <coughs> the other one of the points that, uh, of the many many points in this paper, which is actually very rich. So, don't I don't want this to feel like I'm criticizing the paper. I'm just complimenting, if you wish. It's a different view. Uh, or somewhat uh, slightly, uh, the, the, the bias a little bit different. Uh, so they are absolutely right. You see Chile, this is the, the first 1998 crisis that they discussed in the paper. Obviously, the interest rates went through the roof. No question about that. On the other hand, when you look at the, the US, interest rate uh, were around 5%. Nowadays, we will consider that uh, very high, right? So, whereas in the second one, the, the interest rates in the US, as everybody knows, plunged to basically zero. So, be careful in uh, attributing that to, to the policy of the of, uh, uh, floating exchange rates in, the, in Chile, which certainly it is associated with that. You see the, the, the blue line is, is Chile, so certainly Chile follows through and uh, that was associated with a big devaluation at the time, no question about that, but uh, in the background, the US was doing the same thing, so it is much easier in principle, 
uh, given the central role that the US dollar has to, to, to play a game of this, of this sort. So that sort of thing, I think, are worth uh, at least keeping in mind. In terms of trade, in the paper, I believe, uh, this is such a rich paper that I may, may have missed some corners, but I think they put a lot of emphasis on the pr price of uh, copper, uh, not in terms of trade. And here you have the two uh, crises. So you see that uh, the second crisis, uh, uh, in terms of the test of trade, has improved quite a bit. So on top of everything, because that that's the uh, the commodities uh, cycle, right? So that, that was also helping, uh, and it was it improved had improved substantially now. In within each one of these two episodes, uh, you see that uh, there's a lot of fluctuations around the 2008, which is in line with the fact that I showed before that the financial crisis itself, in terms of MB, was very short. So you had a decline and then a recovery. So uh, on on average, I mean, if you take some kind of a trend, uh, you see that uh, the trend continues, except for a little uh, hole. In the, in the middle. Whereas here, actually, when you look at the 1998 crisis, you see a trend going down in the, in the terms of trade. So that's something that should uh, be taken into account. So another unfavorable condition. Now, uh, in terms of trade, which I like, uh, partly something that uh, we have explored with uh, Enrique Mendoza years ago, uh, before this crisis, uh, before the 2008 crisis, uh, we like this one for, and I think some analysts also in, in Chile look at this uh, uh, in terms of trade uh, uh, statistic. Uh, it's not, not just copper, but copper divided by oil price. And uh, here you have a different picture, but still you see that in 1998 to 2000 is a period where uh, the fall, these are in logs, so so, so, you, see so you, you can compare the slopes, right? Uh, so you see the slope and the duration is uh, are larger. So again, from this perspective, taking these two, uh, these considerations into account, 1998 was a difficult period. I, I really, I, I think something that we should, uh, my advice would be, don't underestimate 1998. I think it, was a, they, they were tried by fire. This economy was tried by fire. All the conditions were difficult, very difficult. And they kept on fighting inflation. And of course, when you look back sometimes in the discussion, uh, they blame the central bank who were generating such sharply high uh, interest uh, rates. Yeah, you don't like that. But you're paying a price, so you, they kept doing that, and the rate of inflation actually during that, there was no, no sign of uh, the, the central bank uh, uh, backing down. Uh, in fact, the rate of inflation continued going down, and possibly, I mean, one possible conjecture is that because you fought very hard through that period, you were ended up building credibility, the point that uh, the paper emphasizes and, and the governor mentioned in his presentation. So and by doing that, maybe there was a, a, a dosage of credibility that uh, was important perhaps to help Chile then develop the institutions that are emphasized in the paper uh, that help uh, playing the floating exchange rate uh, a game with assurance and effectiveness. I notice that my time is, uh, let me just go through this. Uh, international reserves is an issue which is not mentioned here. Now, you would say, why, why, why would I mention this? This is the international reserves at the central bank. So you see in the uh, second episode, the 2008, you see that actually international reserves as measured by the central bank, held by the central bank, increased. So you say uh, that didn't play a role. Well, but you know, in this country you have a, the sovereign wealth fund, 
which is very large. If you put together sovereign wealth funds and the reserves of the central bank, then you get a different picture. This falls by around 14%. So if we put everything together, of course, there are technicalities. You wouldn't want to do it absolutely like that, but to give a feeling of the firing power that they had with international reserves, it's not that they didn't use it. Uh, they used it. Not only, they, and they use it also to have a very a sizable expansionary uh, fiscal policy, one of the largest in the region. And by the way, uh, this is important to keep in mind, although it's somewhat different from uh, the emphasis in the paper, Chile outputs is the one that uh, was the largest, showed the largest drop in the region. So despite all of this firing power, despite having floated exchange rate, output was hit badly compared to the rate. Hit badly compared to Peru, which I'm going to bring in, in a moment uh, for comparison. <coughs> and Peru doesn't have a filial floating exchange uh, uh, rate. Uh, they intervene much more in this. So don't take that as a negative comment on the paper. I'm just saying there are other things uh, that are important. This one you would like to take into account. Uh, and it brings about all kinds of interesting issues, by the way, because this, uh, co this uh, contraction in, in the, the use of, uh, of the sovereign wealth fund is something that was not, in principle, coordinated with the central bank because it's held by, it's managed by uh, the, by the uh, finance ministry. So there are interesting issues. <laughs> I don't have time to, to go into that. Uh, now, the shocks. Uh, this one, one thing that I want to uh, emphasize here. In the paper, maybe here is a slight disagreement on how to interpret this. In the paper, uh, uh, the, the recovery of the current account after the crisis, the rapid recovery in 2009 uh, is, uh, is uh, portrayed as uh, something good. Now, the recovery of the current account during the crisis is sudden stop. It's another form of sudden stop, so it's not necessarily good. It happens in many cases because imports go down. So one has to be careful to at least uh, split that uh, shock between uh, imports and exports and so on. But uh, the, the point that I want to highlight, and it's something that uh, Carmen Reicher and I are beginning to think these days, is what we call the current, the, the private current account. The private current account is defined as the difference between the current account and the fiscal balance. Because you have two big savers here the fiscal and the rest of the economy, right? So what the current account, the private current account adjustment uh, is better measured by, by this concept. Now, uh, it so happens that the adjustment, the number that I want to highlight is 13.9 increase in the uh, private current account, which is an enormous adjustment of the in the private sector. It's the largest that I've seen. Uh, uh, so it's interesting because um, there is no time to, to discuss this in any, in any detail. It's a period where you see the fisc being extremely expansive and however, the private sector was uh, in a way contracting, having to make a very strong adjustment. How could that happen if you put so much money on the table? Well, I don't say, want to say that this is what happened, but it's perfectly possible that if you have a sovereign wealth fund, you have a crisis like 2008, and you put a lot of money on the table to big corporations so that they are able to refinance, do the rolling over of their debt, uh, <coughs> you can spend a sizable amount of money doing that without changing credit domestic credit in an iota, nothing. And in fact, in the case of, uh, of Chile, 
and I'm, I'm coming to the end. This is uh, the flow of credit, and uh, w and uh, this. Uh, so you see that in 1998, 99. Uh, the, I'm sorry, 2008, 9, the, the Lehman crisis. There's a very sharp collapse in credit of more than two standard deviations. Actually, it's about three standard deviations. This is one of the largest that I've seen. You know, we, we do these kinds of things all the time. Uh, we, we are uh, obsessed about this concept of sudden stop. But uh, here, you see, it's a very sharp collapse in, in credit, which happens at the same time that you seem to be having a very expansionary f fiscal policy and, and spending trucks of money uh, from your international reserves. But that's perfectly <coughs> possible because you are doing a favor to the corporate sector, which is highly indebted, trying to do the best for the system. But that does not necessarily translate in more credit. Do we know that? Yeah, we've seen that in Europe. We continue discussing it in, in Europe, right? You, uh, uh, you put loads of money in, in, the, in the market, but credit does not uh, expand. The banking sector, financial system, stand, I have to stop, otherwise they will kick me out. Another sudden stop, uh, <laughs> which is good to show that it has some practical relevance. <laughs> and uh, I don't, I won't be uh, give any details. But Chile, 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 and Peru. I suggest that we should uh, take a look at that uh, because they are very parallel in terms of inflation. They are parallel in this one. I don't have to, to discuss in growth actually. The red one is, uh, is, is Peru, so it contracts, but less than, than Chile. So here, the other thing I, I would suggest that in the next steps, which I'm sure these guys are gonna work for a long time, they could very rich uh, pace, uh, it would be interesting to compare to Peru, because Peru is a copper-intensive country, uh, it's next door, uh, it's very parallel, but they don't float. Like, like Chile. So I have to stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Guillermo.